Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So as I have indicated uh, that mathematical modeling finds widespread application in process analysis in design, uh, also in automation or control, uh, it finds widespread application in artificial intelligence and uh, finally, if you are thinking of uh, you know optimizing a process uh, in terms of some operating variables, you got to have a mathematical framework based on which we can carry out the optimization task. Now, uh, Automation as I have or process control as I have indicated uh, is uh, done on a dynamic fashion or on an online fashion. That means, with the process the mathematical model interacts continuously and the mathematical model provides useful feedback for controlling of the process as it could be in the case of melt level control or the roll pass uh, gap adjustment and uh, so on. On the other hand, uh, process analysis, pro process design. Uh, and process optimization are done on an offline fashion. That means, uh, the steel making process is going on in the industry, while you can sit down in your laboratory, uh, you with the aid of a computer, you can carry out some process analysis, some design and make certain recommendations uh, to the shop floor personnel for improving the performance of the process. About artificial intelligence, uh, the mathematical model can provide useful input to the artificial intelligence structure or it can also obtain useful uh, input from the artificial intelligence structure and embody it in the mathematical uh, model. Now, how many types of mathematical models generally we encounter in steel making? Broadly speaking, we would say that we have a mechanistic model, and empirical there are many subdivisions which may be possible because empirical models i for example i can classify empirical models based on the standpoint from which an empirical model has been de derived for example i can say i can derive an empirical model purely based on regression analysis i hope you have heard this term okay on the other hand i can carry out i can derive an empirical model based on some dimensional reasoning or dimensional analysis as well as some experimental data. Finally, I can derive the empirical model also from the viewpoint of an artificial intelligence uh, procedure or technique uh, such as we can apply genetic algorithms, we can apply artificial neural nets and derive. So, many further subdivisions are possible. Mechanistic models for example, we can derive it uh, from various standpoints. Okay. It can have, uh, these are basically based on as the name suggests, uh, these are based on uh, certain conservation principles okay, and people may subdivide mechanistic models also say that you know it has a, a different kind of uh, connotation in the context of population balance, but nevertheless we would be talking about some conservation principle, some balance principle on the other hand an empirical model which is going to be derived purely on experimental standpoint embodying experimental data. Because mechanistic model, so the further subdivisions I am not going to discuss here, that is not of our immediate interest. We will consider models under only these two categories, that either it is a mechanistic model or it is an empirical model as far as we are concerned. Now, mechanistic models, for example, they are based on the conservation principle. Conservation of what? Conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, conservation of energy, uh, conservation of uh, uh, you know population uh, balance. Uh, and all these kinds of concepts can be used to formulate the model, because mechanistic models are based on solid scientific principles as the name itself indicates, right? the fundamental laws of physics these models are based on. So, therefore, a mechanistic model formulated in India will equally work provided it is certain, you know we have been able to derive the model realistically in other countries as well. But for example, an empirical model which we may develop uh, and which may be specific to a particular plant may not work you know uh, for all different plants because empirical models contain 
experimental data points, which are specific to a given plant or given set of conditions. So, they lack universality. On the other hand, mechanistic models are sufficiently general, they are not governed by the geographical boundaries, they are sufficiently general and they work uh, across the geographical boundaries, provided we can formulate the mechanistic model correctly. For example, I can say that we can carry out a heat balance and write a heat conservation equation, okay, which can be a very complex equation in terms of the geometry or the process itself, not a simple one dimensional equation. So, I can write a heat conservation equation and say that well, this represents uh, the mechanistic model uh, for a, a given process. Uh, empirical models on the other hand, basically uh, they are, you, you look at them like a algebraic equations, on the other hand mechanistic models most of the time uh, the, these will appear as uh, partial differential equations to us. As we, as we discuss this further, it will be uh, clear to you. Now, I have also indicated that when we try to develop a mathematical model, we have to first define the problem, what we want to develop. So, merely saying I want to develop a model for a ladle, I want to develop a model for continuous casting is not enough. So, the foremost or the most important task is the problem identification or problem definition. This is the most important task, problem definition or problem identification. This is the first step in model building, mathematical model building. Let me illustrate this with an example. Suppose, I have a furnace. This is a furnace chamber. Suppose, it is a gas fired furnace. So, you have burners from all sides. So, this is the top view, so, I am looking from the top. So, that is the cross section of the uh, furnace and we have, we are seeing that there are burners here everywhere, okay, from all sides. These are gas burners and my objective could be, I have a slab which is sitting here, which is a continuously cast slab. I have put that slab and the interest here may be to find out that after what time following its insertion, uh, the slab will attain a certain temperature. Because slabs basically, uh, once you have a, you have continuously cast slabs formed, you take them after some time gap into a reheat furnace, heat them up, bring them up to the recrystallization temperature, soak them in a furnace, so that they are homogeneous and then you transport them for further processing in rolling mill, uh, etcetera. Okay? So, therefore, uh, I may have a furnace which may be running at a temperature of 1200 degree centigrade. I may have inserted the slab at a time t is equal to 0, when the slab temperature may be everywhere, all points, because this slab is a three dimensional geometry. So, temperature at x for all value of coordinates, I, if I define the system by x, y and z coordinate system, okay, in that case it represents that at t is equal to 0. So, that is what it is x, y, z and t, the temperature everywhere is t 0, which may be say 25 degree centigrade. That means, the slab under question, I have kept it following continuous casting, uh, you know, uh, in the bay area and it has cooled down to room temperature and now I am putting it back into a reheat furnace and I want to find out that give me the time, at what time? I do not know, for all points the temperature becomes say 1180 degree centigrade, just putting a reasonable value. So, I want that the slab to be homogeneous okay, in terms of its temperature that everywhere at some point of time the temperature is going to be 1100 degree centigrade. I want to find that. One way would be you know to direct the radiation pyrometer through some windows onto the surface, but then the radiation pyrometer will give you the surface temperature. You will not be able to find out that what is the inside temperature, whether the slab is all through homogeneous or not. So, the problem definition is clear here. I want to find out the homogenization time for a given slab inserted with an initial temperature field to obtain a final temperature all through of about 1180 degree centigrade. So, this is the problem. 
Now, once I have identified the problem, next comes the stage of what is called as a conceptual model. So, the definition and this is the most important part actually is the problem definition identification. How clearly can you define the problem? The more clear with more certainty you will be able to define the problem, more easy will be uh, you know to formulate the mathematical equation. That is the conceptual model. Conceptual modeling is a state which is before the formulation. So, after this we have formulation, mathematical formulation. Before mathematical formulation, before you can write down that this is the equation that describes the temperature within the object and if I solve this equation, which is essentially an unsteady state equation, unsteady state because it is time dependent and it is a three dimensional equation that we are considering about. We are talking about heat flow in the system. So, we are talking about thermal energy conversion uh, conservation. So, therefore, before we can formulate the equation actually, whether the equation in which coordinate system we will write the equation, how many terms will the equation contain, all these things we have to do a little bit of conceptual modeling, which is very important part. For example, in conceptual modeling, you will try to address that well, I have the furnace, I have the slab geometry, what is the coordinate system that I will like to use. For example, equations would be derived maybe in terms of depending on the geometry. Maybe you have a spherical geometry, maybe you have a cylindrical geometry, maybe you have a Cartesian geometry. So, based on that, you are going to derive the equation. So, you can say that well, is the object really a two dimensional object? or it is a three dimensional object. Thirdly, you can say that well, how do I solve this problem? I mean, do I have to really solve the temperature here also within the furnace environment and within the solid also? Or it is just that I can assume that the furnace temperature everywhere is 1200 degree centigrade, heat is being transported to the surface of the solid slab by radiation and then I formulate the problem. So, a series of questions needs to be asked in order to get complete picture of what you are really looking at. And it is only when you have done this, you are in a position to write or the governing equation or you can formulate the problem mathematically. For example, I can say, I can go in the reverse direction. If I write down that well, the equation goes something like this. This is the heat conservation equation and then I write this particular equation this is these are the transport of heat through conduction within the solid. So, this is conservation of heat heat energy within the solid. This is the unsteady state term because the temperature initially it is 0 it is gradually changing and attaining towards approaching uh, 1200 degree mark. So, this is the unsteady net rate of accumulation, this is the conduction along the x direction, this is the conduction along y direction, conduction along the z direction and then we have the source term. So, this essentially once I write this equation, you will be immediately know that well I am considering an unsteady state phenomena, I am considering a three dimensional phenomena 1, 2 and 3 and I am also considering that there is a finite heat source term in the system. For example, the, this may be initially uh, uh, ferrite pyrolite steel, okay, plain carbon steel containing ferrite and pyrolite and we know that when we heat the sample, the ferrite pyrolite will combine in some proportion to give rise to austenite. So, solid state phase transformation reaction may take place within the solid and that solid state phase transformation reaction may produce some amount of heat and that heat must be accounted for in the governing equation. 
So, looking at the equation, you can backtrack and find out for what conditions you have written. Similarly, if you try to say now that, well, I would like to consider, I go in a reverse direction, unsteady state equation. I consider three dimensional equation phenomena. I consider a Cartesian coordinate geometry. I say that this conduction, which is taking place only within the solid, okay, I am not bothered about the surroundings I am looking at, because my objective is what? I want to find out the time for the slab to attain a temperature of 1100 degree centigrade. So, this is not of my immediate interest the surrounding, it is the solid object which is of my immediate interest. So, therefore, I can say that well Cartesian coordinate, three dimensional source term, unsteady state problem and then the task becomes simple. It is a unsteady state three dimensional heat conduction with a finite source term. Of course, as a modeler, you have to now provide an expression for H t. You must understand this, this represents only one equation and hence we can at the most have one unknown and the unknown here is the temperature, which as the equation indicates is a function of x, y, z and t. So, we have to have some expression for the source term and this source term itself may be temperature dependent. If you remember the iron carbon phase diagram, then you can see, you can look at the tie lines and find out that the proportion of austenite will change depending on what temperature it is. So, therefore, this S t is actually a function of time. So, therefore, this is a non-linear heat source term, because unless you know the temperature, you will not be able to predict uh, or solve this particular equation. So, as far as the formulation is concerned, we can now formulate the problem. I am going to come back to it, but note that because we are talking of mechanistic model and that I said mechanistic models are going to give rise to partial differential equation always, we have to not only write down the equation, but we have to provide the boundary condition also. It is the formulation essentially implies that we have to write down the governing equation, we have to write down the bound, corresponding boundary condition and then only the statement of the problem is complete, then only we can say that yes, we have been able to formulate the problem correctly. This exercise can be taken for example, in the context of a ladle metallurgy. You can say that well, I have a ladle gas injection procedure and what I want to model there? Well, I have added a ferroniobium solid and I want to find out that after what time ferroniobium gets completely dissolved in the uh, steel bar. So, your problem def definition is complete. Now, you have to look at, well, the slag contains, next we go to the conceptual modeling. It is a cylindrical system, okay, but the plug is located away from the axis of symmetry. So, it is a three dimensional problem basically, but it is a multi phase problem. I have gas injection, I have a slag layer, I have melt. Do I solve it as a multi phase problem? Do I solve uh, it as a steady state problem or an unsteady state problem. So, all these questions you are going to ask and then you can say that well, I can having conceptually modeled the situation, I can say that because dissolution is a mass transport phenomena, I have to have you know the flow in the system known. So, therefore, I have to solve the fluid flow equation. Having obtained the fluid flow equation, I will solve the mass transport equation because dissolution is a mass transport phenomena and that is the way we are going to formulate the problem. Once we write the conservation of momentum or fluid flow equation, conservation of mass of the mass transport equation, we will write the boundary condition and then we will say yes, we have been able to formulate uh, the dissolution of ferroniobium in steel uh, in a realistic manner, because we have been able to write down the corresponding equations or differential equations, which we call as the governing equations together with the boundary condition. Once we have mathematical model formulation and then we are going to solve this equation. Solution. This is very important for us and we will discuss this in detail later on. Solution, because this partial differential equations in most of the cases, you will not be able to solve analytically. Analytically means, suppose you have, you have solved many differential equations, okay, the non homogeneous equations, you have then, uh, you have written complementary functions uh, and simple ordinary differential equations. even. Unsteady state equations also through product solution techniques, error function solution techniques can be solved uh, by hand, uh, but these equations cannot be solved by hand. Okay. So, you, you will not be able to solve analytically, which means if you give you give it a pen and paper, you will not be able to solve this equation. We have to resort to numerical techniques to solve this equation. What does a numerical technique do? A numerical method basically converts an algebraic equa differential equation into a set of algebraic equations and 
one and then solve the then we solve the equation. So, the purpose of the numerical method is to convert a given differential equation into the corresponding algebraic equations and then we require once we have a set of algebraic equations, large number of algebraic equations, then of course, we require a digital computer otherwise we will be taking very, very long time to solve it. So, the set of algebraic equations can be solved with the aid of a suitable solution uh, algorithm or a computer uh, platform or computer program, whatever you may like to say. So, partial differential equation P d e and this gets to algebraic equation in solution. not just one algebraic equation, many algebraic equation it gets to and between the two, what connects the two is the numerical method. One important point I would like to say that there are innumerable numerical methods available by which you can translate a partial differential equation into a set of algebraic equations. So, therefore, the form of the algebraic equation is going to be different depending on the what kind of a numerical methods you have applied to translate this differential equation into a set of equations. For example, if I take a differential equation, use Taylor series approximation, I will get one, one type of algebraic equations. If I use um, a different kind of uh, algorithm, uh, for example, you know, if it is an ordinary differential equation, there are innumerable algorithms like I can I can consider Ranga Kutta method, I can consider Ranga Kutta Gill method, uh, second order method, four order, fourth order method. Uh, Adams Moulton method, so many, and in each cases, the final algebraic equation uh, looks different. So, therefore, the solution of the algebraic equation are also going to be different depending on what sort of a numerical methods we apply. But we must understand that the partial differential equation together with the boundary condition defines the problem explicitly, which implies that we have to have a unique set of solutions. Now, since I have said that different numerical methods will produce different algebraic equations and hence different solutions, this seems to contradict my statement, but mind it that eventually an algebraic solution, because when you write down the algebraic equations, convert the differential equations into algebraic equations, we solve the equations at discrete location in the system, which we call as the various nodal points. So, when the large nodal points are used in the system or the resultant number of algebraic equations very, very large. In that case, the solution despite having different numerical methods going to be identical and that solution basically we talk about the grid independent solution. So, when you do mathematical modeling, it is very important for us to establish a grid independent solution, which is a meaningful solution, which is a reflection of the solution of the differential equation together with its boundary condition. So, we solve the equation. And we can try now to get certain asymptotic solution for which I have analytical solution. For example, I have a three dimensional equation that I have written. Now, if I set this term to be is equal to 0, consider that this term is going to be is equal to 0, that is a steady state phenomena with no heat source, then I have it is a pure steady state heat conduction in three dimension. And if I now say that well, all surfaces are fixed at certain temperature, a benchmark situation, which has nothing to do with the problem. I am going to, because I solve the equation, but I have to understand and I have to know also that this conversion is correct algebraic equation and the solution that I am going to get is a meaningful solution, is a correct solution. How do I test it? So, under certain limiting or asymptotic situation, I am going to solve these equations and a typical benchmark solution or a limiting situation is that we write down the complete model for this okay, based on the conversion and the solution techniques. And we say that well in the computer program or platform, let us set this source term to be 0, let us consider a steady state situation by considering this to be equal to 0. We then find out that the problem confers to a steady state three dimensional scenario. And then if we further assume that all surfaces are maintained at a constant temperature, need not be same. Okay. In that case, an analytical solution to this particular problem is possible, which are given in standard heat conduction textbooks. So, I can run my computer program, I can solve the equation and for this particular limiting situation, I can compare with my textbook solution. Okay? So, and then I can say, well, you know, there is a reasonable 
certainty that the programming that I have done is correct, because it is able to replicate many such solutions uh, which are given in by other people or other sources. We can also say that, well, I am not the first person to solve this equation. There may be many other people who have solved these equations for uh, certain different cases or different boundary conditions. Okay. So, I can also run my computer program or run my solution of the differential equation for certain situations which have been relatively well investigated and reported by previous investigators. And then I can say that, well, I have developed a computer program. The computer program produces estimates of temperature that agree well with uh, those reported by various other investigators. So, I have, a con I have some confidence that yes, the computer program or the solution methodology that I have developed following problem definition, conceptual modeling and mathematical formulation is indeed correct and gives reasonable estimate. So, having obtained some confidence about the numerical solution technique, now is I am going to, this is going to bifurcate and at one stream, I am going to now run this program in its entirety. Now, no more asymptotic solution. So, I am going to use the exact equation which I have written. I am going to write down the exact boundary condition, what type of boundary conditions are there. Of course, I am not talking it, talking about it, but we know that every differential equation will have some boundary conditions and initial conditions. For example, if you know a simple second order ordinary differential equation, if you integrate that, you will get two constants of integration. How do you de derive those constants of integration? You obtain these constants of integration from the boundary condition. So, similarly, we will have seven boundary conditions attached to it. There is a second order term, two conditions on x, two conditions on y, two conditions on z and one condition on t. So, with seven conditions embedded, I should be able to solve the exact problem that I have been able to identify in the beginning. So, I can solve the problem. industrial simulation. simulation. At the same time, I have been able to, when I do industrial simulation, I have been able to find out that, well, the inside temperature is this, outside temperature is this at various times. So, I want to check whether my results are correct or not. So, parallelly, along with industrial simulation, I can carry out some experiments. So, I can use techniques to determine the surface temperature, for example, and then I can compare the two. So, these experiments can be carried out, for example, maybe with a contact pyrometer or maybe with an optical radiation pyrometer. So, I can measure from distance what is the surface temperature at certain time. The model can also predict, once you do the exact simulation of the industrial process, that the time temperature history uh, at various locations. So, this comparison will give us an idea that whether our model has been correct or not. As I have mentioned to you, that there may be many assumptions involved in formulating the governing equation, in formulating the boundary condition. For example, this heat source term, we can make various kinds of an approximation okay, in order in, 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 uh, to formulate that how the heat is liberated because of the solid state phase transformation equation. Also, I can formulate as I said that the transport of heat from the surrounding to the surface, whether it is by conduct convection, whether it is by radiation, what is the heat transfer coefficient? what is the emissivity of the surface, many assumptions may be there, okay? many idealizations may be there. So, we are not expecting that there is going to be one to one correspondence between the experiments and industrial simulation. So, there is going to be some amount of uncertainty and therefore, it is always desirable as I have mentioned that models without measurements are incomplete. So, therefore, in any sensible investigation, we have to have parallel experiments and simulation experiments as well as the model simulation and this will give us some idea that how realistically we have been able to formulate the model and the boundary condition. At this particular point, we may find that well some tuning may be necessary because we have done some uh, uh, made some assumptions and some idealizations. So, therefore, uh, there is some discrepancy or differences between this and this. So, in order to have 
in order to match the predictions with experiments oriented, we say it force fitting. So, now we find out that well, say at a given location, this is psi and t at certain location capital X, say y, z and certain time, time t 1. So, at certain specific location capital X at certain time t 1, suppose I find that or I can say that no, it varies as a function of at a location of x, uh, capital X as a function of uh, y, z and t. So, I can say that at this particular location suppose the temperature varies something like this. This is my prediction. I would write it like this. This is other way. Say, let us fix y, let us fix z as a function of x and as a function of t. So, that is what it is. Okay. The fixed value of y, fixed value of z as a function of x and t, I am plotting the temperature. So, this is actually t at a location x as a function of time. So, this is my prediction and I can find that well, my measurements are going like this. Okay. In that case, it may be possible to do some tuning and bring all the points a little bit closer. Okay. And I can find out that well, now my points have become uh, like this. So, I am forcing the points, these are actual observations and I am forcing the points to correspond to uh, the actual uh, or the prediction. And this has happened, this difference has happened between uh, this is the actual measurements actual measurements and what, what are the reasons for this difference that my actual measurement is here while the line goes something like this and the actual measurements are different from the line because of the fact that we have some idealizations and simplifications in formulating the model. So, I wish to, now this is not going to be a very realistic model. So, therefore, I want to uh, say uh, bring, these are the actual measurements. So, I want to bring this for example, I can say that uh, this basically uh, say I can move this line little bit here. So, let us bring it like this. So, these are my actual measurements, these are my actual measurements and this is the line that I have predicted. So, there is evidently some difference between the experimental points and the model line. Now, I, I cannot change these are actual measurements. So, these points cannot be altered, okay. but I can change the model from here the line can go I can bring it here by changing certain parameters for example, changing thermal conductivity, changing boundary conditions, changing source term I should be able to change the prediction take it up or take it down. So, this is called this stage of bringing the prediction closer to the reality is termed as a force fitting or so this is the tuned model so in many cases model tuning is going to be necessary because we will make we have made certain amount of idealizations and so once this whether tuning is necessary or not these two steps are going to determine when you do industrial simulation when you carry out experiments and we find out that there is large differences between the two. In that case, we will tune the mathematical model, introduce some fudge factors, adjust the heat transfer coefficient, adjust the thermal conductivity value, manipulate the source term in order to get better correspondence with the experimental measurements. And this uh, purple color line shows that now with model tuning, I have been able to get the trend of the actual variation fairly realistically. So, I say it is an industrially now tuned mathematical model and this mathematical model is now all set for implementation on the shop floor for doing process analysis, design, optimization, whatever you would like to say or consider. Now, coming back to this particular issue. So, I have how the models are formulated that has been discussed. Now, we understand that in major many cases, uh, tuning of the model is going to be necessary. I want to elaborate this. Now, there are many cases when we can, where we can formulate the equations exactly. For example, you all know that if I have the pipe flow problem, flow of fluid through a pipe, I can write the exact equation, I can write 
the exact boundary condition, absolutely no problem. I can get an analytical solution and in that case, I will find out that analytical and numerical solutions will match exactly with the experimental observation. Suppose, I measure the velocity with a laser Doppler velocimeter, if it is a transparent tube, then I can measure the velocity with a PIB, I can measure the velocity with a hot film anemometer, I can compare with my numerical model, fully developed flow through a pipe, there is going to be not even a little difference between prediction and experiment. Prediction and experiment will match in total, there are no question of many model tuning terms. So, therefore, we can see that there are certain physical situations for which we can formulate the problem exactly. Okay. We can write down the equation correctly, we can write down the governing equations correctly and there will be no problem as far as matching of prediction and experiments are concerned. So, this is the first category of the problem. The second category of the problem is that, where our understanding is not complete. Okay. So, therefore, many idealizations and approximations will go in model building. In that case, what happens? We will invariably expect that the model predictions and experimental observations will not match, because our understanding of the physical scenario uh, or physics of the process is not uh, totally clear. For example, how does when you inject gases, argon gas through the ladle, how a gas envelope forms around the orifice, how it devolves into a plume, how it breaks up, the big gas envelope breaks up into a number of bubbles, how the bubbles coalesces during their rise or disintegrates, this complete picture, we understand it reasonably, but the picture is not absolutely clear as of today. So, therefore, if I have to write model equations for this particular phenomena, that the injection of a injection of gas, its formation of a big gas envelope, its break up into a number of bubbles, the coalescence of the number of bubbles into a bigger one and all this phenomena, incorporating all this phenomena, if I have to write down the you know, model for bubble size distribution, you will see that there is going to be lot of idealizations in the answer. In the secondary cooling zone of a continuous cluster, for example, if I have to say that, well, I want to develop a mathematical model for heat transfer coefficient from the first principle, there also we will see that, yes, our understanding is far from being complete, because the impinging, you have a, you have a nozzle through which you have spray mist, which is coming, it is a spray mist is what? It is air and water. So, the spray mist comes and this is the surface of the billet and the spray mist impinges on the surface and in the process, it breaks down into number of droplets, it impinges on the hot surface, removes heat from the hot surface. So, therefore, uh, you know this process is extremely complex and our understanding of droplet formation, breaking of the continuous stream into droplets, impingement of the droplets, evaporation etcetera uh, at the surface, uh, these are far from being complete. So, as a result of which, when we try to formulate problems for this scenario, these scenarios, we will see that considerable amount of idealizations and approximations will go in to model building. Unfortunately, steel making processes fall in the second category. Steel making, mathematical models of steel making are not going to be like pipe flow problems that we can write down the equation exactly, that we can formulate the governing boundary conditions exactly. No, we will never have this kind of a scenario in steel making, because of the inherent complexities of the subject, because of the nature of the manufacturing uh, techniques. So, therefore, it is understood, it is to be appreciated at this stage, that when you build models for steel making processes, inherent problems, inherent idealizations are going to be there in the formulation of the governing equations. Idealizations will be there in terms of formulating the boundary conditions and the initial conditions and all these are going to be a matter of concern and all these are going to give us some deviation from the experimental observations. People in industry today say that if your model can predict within plus minus 25, 20 percent, 25 percent of what we see in the industry, we will consider your modeling to be reasonably good. So, that is the kind of uh, range or the tolerance we are given. Uh, because of lack of complete understanding of uh, the subject. Now, we can say that once we have uh, identified the problem, we have solved the problem, we have tuned the problem, now we have, we are, in a, we are in a state that yes, we have a mathematical model that has demonstrated performance. Of course, following tuning, tuning will always be necessary in industrial optimization and industrial design. So, the mathematical model developed cannot be in straight forward way applied. So, without this 
companion experiments, we will never know the extent of tuning which is uh, necessary. So, therefore, I have been repeatedly telling that merely solving governing equations and boundary conditions are not enough. This is called as a black box modeling. We have to have companion measurements in order to demonstrate the uh, applicability or suitability of the mathematical model that we have been able to formulate. Now, let us look at the issues of uncertainty. As we have tried to indicate uh, so far that the formulation of the model uh, as well as the boundary conditions are going to give rise to some amount of uncertainty. Now, uh, I will explain very briefly uh, the context in the context of uncertainty in boundary condition. For example, if I have to model that uh, scenario which again I will draw here. Okay. So, there you may require that what is the ambient temperature. Now, I can say that well the surrounding temperature is 1200 degrees centigrade and it is radiation which is giving heat to the slab through its surface. Okay. Now, therefore, somehow I have to know what is the furnace temperature. So, I have to have a me measuring devices and based on that I will be knowing that what is the surface temperature. So, there is going to be some amount of uncertainty when we rely on empirical measurements on the boundary condition. This surrounding temperature, when I am solving for temperature within the solid, surrounding temperature is needed as a boundary condition. And how do you know the surrounding temperature? By carrying out certain experiments or with some temperature controller or pyrometers, etcetera. So, therefore, those measurement devices also have some inherent errors. So, therefore, certain amount of error and uncertainty is going to be associated with this. Similarly, when you are talking of heat flow modeling of heat transfer in the melt and then we, we require that well, what is the difference in temperature here is a result of Q loss. So, we must know that at what rate through the refractory lining in the ladle heat is being lost outside. How can you know this? There is no way of determining it theoretically. We have to put a probe here, either we measure temperature or we directly measure the heat flux through a heat flux transducer and then tell you that well, this is the rate at which the heat is being lost. So, when I solve, when I write the governing differential equation for heat flow within the melt, these informations will appear as boundary conditions to the governing equation, where from these boundary conditions will be given, these will be directly based on experimental observation. So, that is why when you measure these quantities, either the um, surface, either the temperature within the furnace or the rate of heat loss through the steel shell in a ladle, these are all empirically determined parameters. So, they are all prone to error because of inherent problems associated with the measuring devices. So, we understand that the uncertainties are going to be because of number one, uncertainties in formulating the governing equation correctly. That I have explained. We can have also uncertainties that we do not know, for example, the thermophysical properties of the system, thermal conductivity how it varies as a function of temperature and composition, we may not be exactly knowing. Okay. If we do not know, in that case we can say that well, the properties of the system are not known, high temperature properties and kinetic data, data are all, not always available. So, they also bring in certain amount of uncertainty. So, uncertainty in boundary condition, uncertainty in governing equation, uncertainty in high temperature properties and kinetic data are the major sources of such Okay, that the difference that we are seeing here. So, these three can be considered to be the major reason. We must understand also the numerical methods are also prone to some error, but eventually when you hit that grid independent solution, then that uh, can be uh, uh, forgotten or we may not consider that because grid independent solution have to be identical, but certain numerical techniques if you do not take precautions can give you some erroneous results also. So, numerical error is also one reason so, we have to have a robust numerical method in order to derive solution from the governing equation itself. Now, I have written that heat conduction equation very clearly. How do you formulate these equations? So, having understood, let us go back to this particular issue. Having said that I want to find out the temperature within the solids, then I have to write down, a th I understand that is a thermal energy conservation. Because the tip, I know that the temperature at a point within the location is because of the heat which is being received 
and the flow of heat within the solid itself. It is governed by that. So, it is basically a conservation. Okay. The rate of change of temperature at this particular point is a function of the rate at which the heat is being lost, heat is being heat is coming from the ambient to the surface and I should be able to write an equation uh, for this. So, this is going to be an energy conservation equation. Now, the question is how do I write those equations? I mean, do, do we every time uh, derive a equation uh, from the control volume based uh, approach? For example, you have seen Navier-Stokes equation for example, you know Fourier's uh, equation uh, or Laplace equation. So, how do you derive those equations? We take an elementary control volume and in elementary control volume, we can say that well through this I can say heat is coming in, heat is going out. So, this is x, y and z direction and then we have heat which is coming in this particular direction, living in this particular direction, heat which is coming in this direction, living in this. So, the net rate at which heat content of this control volume increases or changes is a function of the net flux of heat along the field of direction. So, I can set up an elementary control volume and then I can find out that what is the characteristic uh, conservation equation for this particular control volume. Imagine if I take this control volume to be one of the phase merging with the boundary, then that is how through the boundary control volume, I will have the boundary information getting into the calculation domain. This may be an internal control volume okay, and within an internal control volume, I know it is the conduction term, conduction of heat. So, therefore, I would say conduction of heat along x direction, conduction of heat out along x direction, conduction of heat along y direction, conduction of heat out along y direction and so on. So, because this is an internal control volume and one of these surfaces can very well become the boundary surface okay, once the control volume is located here and through that particular surface we have we will have the boundary information getting into the system. So, one way of deriving the model equation is that we set up the control volume, formulate the governing equation and whatever equation I have written earlier that can be derived very easily by control volume formulation. But for every problem it is not justified to write down the control volume formulation and derive the equations, because I am not the first person to investigate heat conduction phenomena. There are in innumerable other people who have studied heat conduction phenomena. These equations are documented in literature. These equations are documented, which I have written for example. So, I now write it in a little bit conservative. divergent k gradient t plus h t. So, if you expand it in three dimension, you get the derivative second order derivative along x, second order derivative along y, second order derivative along z. So, these equations are well documented in the literature. Okay. So, I can once I understand the phenomena, I can pick up that particular equation from a previous work. At the most, I can examine that am I not perhaps blindly copying this equation is the equation dimensionally consistent, is the equation correct, is the equation one I am looking for. So, how can I pick up? There are innumerable equations of heat conduction. I will say two dimensional steady state, two dimensional in cylindrical polar coordinate, three dimensional in Cartesian coordinate, uh, one dimensional in spherical coordinate. So, there are a lot of heat conduction equations that is in front of me. So, how do I pick up the right equation which is applicable to me and that is dictated by the conceptual modeling. At the conceptual modeling itself, I am now able to see that what is the differential equation that I have to pick up from the literature, so that I can altogether avoid this control volume formulation part. You can of course do this if you have time, but it is not necessary always. Okay. The equations are available in the literature, you have to understand the physical scenario and then pick up the correct equation. So, there you say that there are building blocks available. So, this is called I would say a conduction, heat conduction uh, building blocks. So, in heat conduction building blocks, what I will I am going to have? I am going to have heat conduction in three dimension in spherical coordinate, heat conduction in three dimension in spherical coordinate, heat conduction in three dimension in Cartesian coordinate, steady state. Similarly, I can have three other equations, unsteady state heat conduction in Cartesian coordinate, unsteady state three dimensional heat conduction in cylindrical polar coordinate, unsteady state three dimensional equation in spherical polar coordinate. So, I have a series of equations in the heat conduction module or heat conduction building block and I am going to pick up one set of with my own understanding. So, therefore, we have summarized various building blocks 
necessary for mathematical simulation of steel making problem. And these building blocks could be one could be a fluid flow building block. So, building blocks. What does the building blocks contain? Building blocks contain the differential equations or the mathematical models of fluid flow. Why so many mathematical models? Because they contain a set of equations written in unsteady state mode or steady state mode, written in two dimension or three dimension, written in various coordinate systems. So, that is why we have a range of choice available to us. We have to only understand that well, we got to simulate the fluid flow. So, therefore, we have to go to the fluid flow building block and pick up the current situation. We can have building block for turbulence also. There may be various types of turbulence model, okay, as I have mentioned uh, earlier in one of the lectures. So, we can have various kinds of models. It dep you have a choice there, what kind of a model you would like to use. Okay. So, that according to that, you can pick up the right equation that is applicable to your case. You can have heat conduction module, which I have just now discussed. And the counterpart, you can have mass diffusion also. You can have convection diffusion. You can have magneto hydrodynamics, there are all modules or building blocks available to us and there are many such building blocks which are available to us. So, we have to understand the problem, we have to see what we are trying to model and accordingly. So, I want to for example, I will just illustrate, I want to model heat flow within a ladle. Now, I understand that in the ladle, there may be some fluid flow involved, because the transport of heat, this is a liquid. So, within the liquid or in the melt, transport of heat is due to convection and diffusion. Diffusion means it is heat conduction here. So, diffusion is a generic term for all, we have momentum diffusion, we have mass diffusion, we have heat diffusion. Okay? So, therefore, heat diffusion is heat conduction, momentum diffusion is viscous diffusion and mass diffusion is mass diffusion. Okay. So, the movement of temperature, the heat will flow from one point to another point, because of the presence of the fluid flow, as well as the diffusion or heat conduction itself. So, therefore, I will say that I need not a heat conduction module, but a convection diffusion of heat or mass. This is the building block. These are one and the same equations, one and the same type of equations, because temperature and species are scalar quantities. So, therefore, I can say that I can pick up this and then I will have to model, because I am talking of convective heat transport, this convective heat transport I will not be able to address unless I know fluid flow. So, therefore, fluid flow I will have to use and if the flow is turbulence, in that case I will use turbulence. So, these three building blocks will formulate the mathematical framework or provide the mathematical framework for prediction of temperature. Of course, when you talk of this convection diffusion of heat, in that case, we will require thermal boundary conditions to be prescribed. So, all boundary conditions have to be prescribed, whatever is necessary, but as far as writing the governing equations are concerned, we will select fluid flow, we will select turbulence, we will select convection diffusion and then identify what is the dimensionality problem, whether it is a steady state or not. So, from the innumerable number of equations that are available under each of these categories, we are going to pick up the right equation. So, the last point that I want to make here is, we have you know many phenomena which we may have to calculate simultaneously. We may have to calculate, for example, electromagnetically driven flows. For example, if we want to simulate fluid dynamics in continuous casting slabs, where we may have electromagnetic breaking, electromagnetic uh, stirring. So, we may have fluid flow, turbulence, heat transfer, many phenomena can be simultaneously or interrelated. Okay? We have multiphase flows, if we are injecting gases, we have slag metal mixing, we have heat loss we have fluid flow, we have turbulence and if you go to continuous casting, we may have magneto hydrodynamics. So, you may have many such phenomena, it is not just one. In the case of slab reheating, it is just heat conduction, but when you are talking of liquid state processing operations, you may have many different modules, interconnected modules to be used simultaneously to predict a given phenomena. So, 
we, we are talking about solving a series of nonlinear partial differential equations. The equation is not going to be only one, there will be several tens or twelves of such equations we have to solve. And these equations are interlinked with one another, these equations are nonlinear and there may be the boundary boundary conditions may be uh, complex, uh, nonlinear boundary conditions. So, solving this equation is a horrendously complex task. And if you have to write a computer program, this is going to take many man months before you can write the computer program to solve this set of equations and derive a meaningful result of temperature within the limit itself. So, what is the option? There comes a row of commercial softwares. So, today engineering training and particularly people who are involved with steel making and process modeling, they have to know that what are the commercial software uh, platforms available, which they can effectively use to solve the equation. So, your job ends at formulating the problem okay? and then you configure the problem with the aid of commercial software. The solution, when I talk of solutions, the solution essentially encompasses writing of the equation, then coding the equation in a computer and then getting the numbers. So, this coding part can be totally eliminated if you can resort to commercial software. And two commercial softwares which are very popular today are Fluent and Comsol. So, most of the mechanistic models that we use can be solved, mechanistic models for steel making can be solved by using Fluent. Fluent has all these modules, all these building blocks build up. You have to just say that it is three dimensional unsteady state turbulent fluid flow and fluent is going to pick up the correct equations for your system from the building blocks that is in the memory of fluent. So, using this commercial software, you will be able to get the numbers or generate the results in practically no time and then you can post process. That means, you can plot and you can scientifically visualize the results, how does the temperature is changing as a function of time or how does the velocity is changing as a function of time in a little all these features. Okay, you can draw it nicely, you can scientifically visualize and obtain a useful information of the process. So, to conclude uh, the discussion uh, on physical and mathematical modeling, I would say that well, mathematical modeling is a very important part today, because physical modeling does not give us complete picture. So, mathematical model and physical modeling should be applied together and typically, finally, I would say that if you draw a vertex triangle and then in this vertex lies the physical model, in this vertex lies the mathematical model, in this vertex lies the planned scale trial and there is the truth. And so, in order to hit the truth, you have to have these three components and then only possibly you can do process analysis, process design, uh, optimization correctly. So, any comprehensive investigation on steel making must therefore, embody physical modeling mathematical modeling and plant scale in different proportion depending on your resources. And when these three are combined together, you are in a position to get some meaningful results and that is where the truth or the real process lies and it is with this comprehensive knowledge, you will be able to do process design, process analysis, uh, process optimization and control far more uh, effectively.